have you in your lives ever had a conversation with somebody and during that conversation the other person supported by your listening comes alive and maybe you notice it in their faces like they've just realized something that they have never realized before and as that thing becomes revealed to them they're revealing it to you and you're witnessing it and there is a connection between you that is beautiful intimacy. As part of my work on a project called Breath Cafe, I get to have this experience regularly. There's a woman sitting across the room from me and she's speaking slowly and she's looking out the window and her eyes are glazed and she's pausing as she speaks. She's got her baby on her knee and she's remembering. And as I look at her, I sense a kind of a, a light coming from her face and her eyes. And she speaks about the power that she felt as she gave breath to the baby who's on her knee. And as she's speaking about it, she begins to feel that again in her body. She begins to remember the sensation of what that was. And as that feeling returns to her body, she comes more alive. I had my first son, a child, 13 years ago. And that experience for me wasn't what I planned it to be. It wasn't what I dreamed it to be. It wasn't what I had in my birth plan all of those things, it, it was probably the fur furthest along from what it might have been. And the result for me was that for days, weeks, months, and even years afterwards, I experienced trauma, um, although it was undiagnosed and I never used that word. Um, uh, there's an anthropologist, Robbie Davis Floyd, who says that when a woman has a breath experience that is traumatic, she usually goes on to do one of two things. She'll either have a baby very quickly afterwards in a way to maybe get over or heal from the first uh, difficult experience, um, or perhaps to prove she can do it well, or she can do it how she wanted it to be. And then there's a second type of person who might go on to be a breath activist and go out into the world to campaign and try and change things for other women's experiences. So I was definitely falling into that second category. It was five years after I gave birth uh, and I was making a performance. It was my first solo performance and my... Uh, my supervisor at Aberystwyth University said to me, um, you have to make performance about something that really haunts you. If it's not alive for you, then how is it going to reach anybody in an audience? And five years after giving breath, the thing that was still most alive for me was my breath experience. It was unresolved. I couldn't find a peace with it. Uh, I still had lots of questions. When I thought about it, it still came fully alive in my body. And as part of making the performance, I made a video, a 50-minute video of speaking to camera. And I made some rules for myself, I suppose, kind of performance game um, of I choose a single moment in the breath experience, I speak forward from there. Once I'm speaking, I can move around in the narrative and I keep going until I run out of something to say and I start again. So there's a kind of repetition that happens. Um, when I watched the video back, I was really surprised by how still my body was uh, regularly throughout the 50 minutes. So still that I thought the video was freezing, it was pausing. So my body was pausing. And it was a surprise to me because when I was speaking, I didn't feel a pause. I mean, I wasn't stopping, I wasn't having a rest in my thinking. What was going on inside of my body was loads of thinking, loads of sensation, loads of emotion and heat in my body. And it was at that moment that I diagnosed myself as that is the freeze that comes in trauma. And it began a, a journey of healing for me then. Um, I did have some indicators previously. So when my child was one and a half, I attended a, a movement workshop and we were asked to um, breathe into uh, our uh, belly and 
I was feeling very relaxed and calm and I couldn't do it. And I was trying and I was trying and I just couldn't get my breath below my chest. It wouldn't come to my belly. And I spoke to um, the director afterwards and, and, and he said he'd recently had uh, um, an operation on his belly and he'd found the same thing, that after the operation they ju he just couldn't access this part of his body for a while. And so I had these sort of signals, I suppose, that something was amiss in my body and it wasn't until I made the performance three and a half years after that that it became apparent. So I made the performance and right in the middle of it I was doing an action where, um, so it was a 24 hour performance, so now I'm kind of 48 hours awake, my body is in a kind of a extremis and I do an action where I'm turning around very, very slowly. And as I turned around, something happened in my diaphragm, like something moved, a sensation of opening across my diaphragm, and my breath just flooded in. And it was like I was breathing fully for the first time in my life. And really that opened up then a further two or three years of healing. And I went on to have my second son eight years after the first. I was really interested though by then to think about, I've been on this journey that I've kind of discovered for myself, how can I share this with other women? And so I was aware of Death Cafe as a kind of a, a format for us to be able to speak about things which in our society are kind of taboo, we don't necessarily do it every day. And I wondered about the potential for a breath cafe and in a fortuitous uh, encounter meeting, I met Eleanor Shaw from People Speak Up, a company who use autobiographical storytelling with community groups to empower people to, to share their story. And so we set about exploring what are the conditions needed really to support women to be able to tell their birth stories in ways that might be transformative for them. Um, so over the last year we've been running a, a year really of, of workshops exploring it and we found three key things um, that might support women to, to speak their birth stories in ways that are meaningful for them. First of all, the physical space is really vital. When a woman arrives to the space, I want to almost see somebody being able to have that deep breath that they're arriving. There's no expectations of them. There are very comfortable chairs. Hospitality is really important of being able to have some nourishment um, and be able to sit down. We place um, blankets, cushions, lights, beautiful objects around the room and it's beyond decorative purposes, it's not just about aesthetic, it's about how those things impact us when we see them um, because what we're looking to do is try to support the, the release of oxytocin in our bodies so that we have less cortisol and less stress there and those things really support that. Um, the second condition is that uh, we want to be able to slow down. It's not like um, a, a, a kind of a social group in that sense, um, because where we're going to is a space where each woman will get to speak by themselves for as long as they need to speak. And so the sessions last two and a half hours, the first half an hour is just arriving. And in that arriving, so much is happening already. And crucially, we're beginning to attune towards each other. We need to slow down because the body is slower than the mind. And what I'm about to do is encourage people to speak from their bodies. So to do that, we have to be slower. The third condition, and perhaps the most challenging, is at least the invitation to get some space from judgment. Judgment is a really important faculty we have as human beings. It keeps us safe, being able to judge if it's too, if the kettle is too hot to touch or there's too much distance between me and the car. But when we turn that judge inwards, it can be really debilitating. And at the very least, it will diminish our experience of ourselves. So in the process, we want to get some space from judgment, both in how we might judge each other as we're listening and speaking with each other, 
and giving ourselves enough space from our own inner judges to take a risk and try and tell a new kind of story. Within the process, uh, we move beyond the kind of social chatting. I am inviting people to disrupt, really, the social order of how we relate to each other in social groups. So I tell the women who attend that you are not speaking to me to communicate your story to me like I'm communicating to you now. I don't need to understand what you're telling me. It doesn't need to make sense. You can repeat yourself, you can pause, you can be silent. Because what's happening is an invitation to speak so that you might hear yourself speaking, maybe for the first time. And maybe in that listening to the words that are coming, you will hear something new that can support you. And so it's a challenge. We do a lot of resourcing, connecting to the body, first of all. And then the invitation is to allow the body to speak something now and not tell our stories the way we've rehearsed them and told them over and over to everybody for the last eight years since I had my baby. How can I find a story that is true for me here today? And that's challenging because we don't know what our bodies might say, so there's the risk. I'm not a counsellor or a therapist. As Andy mentioned, I'm a performance artist and a researcher but I believe that we all have the right to have agency over our bodies and our own sense of identity. When the narratives we speak about our experiences have been socially constructed, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this happened, ended up in the hospital, and then it was all all right in the end because at least my baby was all right and at least I was all right. That sort of hero narrative, patriarchal narrative, which we have to fit into. And when it's not true for us, then there's a rupture. So how can we find a way of speaking our experiences that are more true for ourselves? So I'm going to finish with, um, with two thoughts or ideas. Uh, based on research uh, that's been carried out in the last 10 years, it's estimated about a third of women giving birth experience trauma and uh, as many as 10% will uh, develop PTSD, often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. What would happen if one in three women who experience trauma were told this can be resolved? and we can help you, we can support you to heal this. We'd have women who feel more connected to their bodies. We'd have women who feel more empowered in their bodies, women who are able to speak their experiences, speak their own truth. Women who feel more sensual and more powerful. And the second thing is, how do we tell our birth stories to our children? And that's really challenging if it's been a, a difficult birth experience and if there's trauma and it's something you don't want to go back to, then maybe we won't say anything about our child being born ever to them. And that might be true for a lot of us here today. Or we might do the opposite, which a grown man, an adult man just told me last week, which is that we say to our child from the minute they're born, giving birth to you really damaged me. You know, I'm in pain all my life because of you. And our children grow up with, with that pain and guilt and shame about how they've inflicted that on us, but they would never choose, they would never choose to hurt us. So the alternative is that we look at the trauma, we look at the pain, and we find a way and the support we need to heal it so that our children too will be allowed to have their own birth stories. Because our children have their own experience that is separate from ours and that will inform their entire lives. How we are all born lives through us all of our lives. Our birth stories are our stories of origin and we get to be the authors of how we speak those stories.
Thank you very much.